Francesca. Okay. Okay, hey everybody, welcome to our next talk about the uh, relation between Debian and F F Free Software Foundation. So please give a warm applause to John Sullivan. Thank you. Um, so my name is John Sullivan, I'm the Executive Director at the Free Software Foundation. Um, I work at the Boston office. I've been there since 2003. Uh, not coincidentally, also the first year I became a Debian user. Um, I've been the executive director just since 2011. And in my free time, outside of that, uh, I've been a Debian developer since 2010. Um, I don't think, uh, contrary to what Linus said last year, that I'm either crazy or on drugs. But uh, I will leave that up to you to decide. Um, and I will plead jet lag, most likely. So unfortunately, as my FSF responsibilities have increased, my time for other free software projects like Debian that I worked on in the past has decreased. So I have to confess that my packages are in a pretty terrible state right now, um, especially the you know, crucial X word package, which I know you've all been missing. How do you do your Sunday crosswords without the X word package? Um, I'm hoping to spend some time this week to get those things back in a better state and make some time to contribute meaningfully. I'm talking here as an FSF representative, um, but as a Debian developer, I also really want to see a closer relationship between the two groups and between the two projects. It's something that's really important to me uh, personally, but I think also really important to both the FSF and Debian as uh, projects that are uniquely committed to free software ideals. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to talk to you all about this today. This is uh, a bigger group than I was expecting. I was surprised to be scheduled on the weekend with the emphasis on the Open Public Day. I'm really honored by that and really appreciate you all being here. So related to that, can I just ask for a quick show of hands how many people saw my session last year in Portland? Okay, so less than half. So um, I am going to uh, cover some things that will be a, a bit repetitive from that last year, but I think it's necessary in order to set the context and, and make some of these points clear. And we have a, well, we uh, have a bit less than an hour here. Um, and my plan was to try to leave at least 15 uh, minutes at the end for a discussion. Um, I'm here to answer any questions or hear any feedback you have for the FSF in general, in addition to the points that I cover in the presentation. Um, but you can still interrupt me if you like uh, as well along the way, um, if you have questions that are especially pertinent to something that I'm saying. So other than Libre Planet, um, which the FSF hosts every year in March, DebConf has quickly become my favorite event of the year. Uh, because it is so committed to both the community and the production of free software. And that is very different from what seems to be the trend at other events that I attend throughout the year, uh, which have a greater emphasis on figuring out how to support proprietary software using free software. So it really feels good to be here. Um, and I am in all, I would love for Libre Planet to be able to travel around the world each year instead of always be located in Boston like DebConf does. But I have no idea how you guys pull that off year after year so well. Um, you know, speaking of working together, maybe we can co-locate an event sometime. That might be a fun thing to try, and also you know, my secret agenda to figure out exactly how you managed to do this so well. Um, I hope that some of you, nevertheless, will make it to Libre Planet in Boston next year. Uh, we've had several speakers from uh, the Debian community there over years past, and it'll be awesome to have more of a presence there. Also, you know, we have a bit of a friendly competition, and now we have to step it up since you've surpassed Libre Planet in terms of attendance. Uh, we need to, get, to do a better job of getting more people there. So congratulations on the record-setting registrations this year. It's awesome to see. This is actually only my third uh, DevConf, but it's my second one in a row. So this is a nice opportunity to be able to check in and present some updates about some of the project possibilities as collaborations that I mentioned uh, last year during the talk. Um, but first thing I want to say is happy birthday. Uh, I couldn't celebrate too much last night because I had to be you know, awake and coherent to present at what is 5 a.m. my time. Uh, but I did enjoy being there, and the vegan cakes were delicious. <laughs> Thank you for having those. Uh, we should also say happy birthday to Gnome, who turned 18 on the same day yesterday. So can we say happy birthday, Gnome? Uh, the FSF is also, uh, well, first I want to say that, that Debian has been and continues to be an, an incredibly important project for free software. And 
nothing that we talk about in terms of the FSF's endorsement uh, or the way that we see particularities of Debian should take away from that big picture view. Um, the FSF has had many servers running Debian over the years with only main installed, of course, uh, and several of the distributions that we actively endorse and promote uh, actually are derived from Debian and couldn't exist without them. So I want to thank you all for your hard work, um, for the quality of the work that you do, you know, the technical quality, and also for uh, your commitment to your free software ideals and the principles that um, have driven Debian for those last 22 years. You know, I think it's incredibly valuable, and, and part, of, part of why I'm here is to uh, help see what I can do to help um, in that work. So the FSF is also celebrating a milestone uh, birthday this year. It's our 30th birthday, uh, and we are having a celebration that I hope some of you will be able to make it to um, on October 3rd in Boston. We'll have both a, a mini a user summit, user freedom summit during the day, and then a party in the evening. And if you can't attend in person, I hope that you will check out. There will be local events around the world that people are already stepping up to organize. There'll be fun opportunities for people to get together um, and celebrate free software and what the free software movement's achieved. So today I want to talk about uh, two main themes. Uh, the first of which is the question of why the FSF, the delicate question of why the FSF doesn't fully endorse uh, Debian and what the possibilities are for changing that situation. And then the second thing I want to talk about is what I think we can work together on in the meantime, even if the meantime turns out to be a really long time. Uh, I chose the, the bad, you know, punny title of this session, you know, Solve Problems at the Source, get it? Yeah. Uh, it's FSF and GNU tradition. Um, because I, I happen to think that if we were together, working together effectively on some of these specific projects, um, we might find ourselves solving the perceived disagreements by side effects um, and getting ourselves closer to the world that we all want to have. So if you look at our big picture goals between the FSF and Debian, they're, they're suspiciously similar. So the Free Software Foundation goal is to have all computer users to be able to do everything they need to do on any computer using only free software. My reading of the Debian goal is that we want to have a universal operating system, which will remain 100% free and never have any non-free requirements. So I take universally to mean able, universal to mean able to run on any computer, big or small, uh, to be used by technical and non-technical users alike with no non-free dependencies. So to me, these visions look strikingly similar. In terms of distributions for the FSF, uh, we don't have a single uh, lone official distribution, but we have a list that we think, a list of distributions that we think are actively implementing the goal that we want to see in the world. These distributions uh, have two key commitments. Um, the first is to remove all non-free software uh, and to not ship any non-free software, and also to avoid steering users towards non-free software outside of the distribution. So last year at this time, the list of distributions that uh, meet these criteria looked like this. It included uh, Blag, from left to right there, Blag, Dragora, Dynabolic, Unusense, Musics, Parabola, Triscoll, which is what the FSF uses primarily on our workstations and servers, and which is based on Debian by way of Ubuntu, uh, and Ututo X, which was the first distribution that was endorsed under these criteria. There's been a few updates to the list since, uh, the, since last year. Protean OS, which targets embedded devices but is also intended for use on laptop boot systems, was added. This is a distribution that uh, can be used in the future, we hope, to replace things like the Intel Management Engine firmware that runs on a separate CPU at boot time uh, in the machine. You can actually, we hope, in the future be able to flash that proprietary operating system with Protean OS. Uh, we also added LibreCMC, which is currently targets uh, wireless routers. Uh, but has a goal of working with other kinds of embedded systems as well. And this was a nice announcement because a couple of uh, months after we announced the distribution endorsement, we were able to announce certification uh, under our Respects Your Freedom hardware program of a wireless router, a home wireless router, running this distribution. So I think this is awesome. You can now, from Think Penguin, purchase a wireless router running 100% free software. 
Uh, I know a lot of us have been waiting a long time for that. There's always been something, you know, either it's the proprietary blob for the wireless or the bootloader for the router. You know, there's always been some non-free component, but all of those things have been replaced um, with free software. So these two distributions together created a new section on our list, actually, which is focused on small system distributions, uh, ones that are targeted towards systems with little resources, like routers and uh, small CPUs inside a machine. We also added the Geeks system distribution, the last one there. Uh, some of you might be interested in that. It's a declarative, has a declarative operating system configuration and has other kind of interesting features, like the ability to do transactional upgrades and rollbacks on a system and uh, have per user installations of packages without uh, giving out root access for sudo. So it's a pretty cool thing, especially for all of you that are interested in functional programming. So why isn't Debian on the list? Uh, so Debian is actually in a special category that's not reflected on the list. Um, and we've been looking for ways to do this, but haven't found a satisfactory one yet. So it's the only distribution that meets the first criterion to not include any non-free software and to remove expeditiously any non-free software that's discovered in the distribution uh, that's not already on the list. And the FSF fully acknowledges this and, and appreciates the work that's been done to, in the official Debian distribution to bring an all-free distribution to users. So that's something that we want to highlight. Um, when Squeeze made the decision to remove the non-free software from the kernel, that final remaining bit, you know, we put out a, an announcement celebrating that achievement um, and highlighting Debian for doing that. And there is no other commonly used major distribution that's in that category. Every other distribution uh, that's considered you know, common among users contains non-free software in its official distribution. So that is something that sets Debian apart. And I know that this message is not always clear. Um, in particular, I know that some well-meaning FSF supporters have a habit of saying that the FSF thinks Debian is non-free. Um, and that's not true. And, and you can now cite this presentation as evidence that that is not true. Um, we say very clearly that Debian main is all free software and upholds commitments just as good as what the FSF uh, expects of ourselves in its official distribution. So in Debian's case, the lack of endorsement is from us is primarily because of the relationship uh, between official Debian and unofficial Debian, the non-free and contrib repositories. And that relationship uh, to us seems too close for our comfort. Um, there are spots in the Debian infrastructure where those uh, sections, even though technically separate, are integrated um, very closely with main. So for example, in package searching, uh, in recommends and suggests fields within packages that are displayed to users. So even though I think in Debian we have an idea that these are separate, that's not, as, not always as clear to users on the outside, and they, will, they can end up um, being you know, sometimes inadvertently or sometimes just uh, led to install non-free components on top of the official distribution. There are also some cases of individual software packages in main uh, after installation, le leading users and recommending users to install non-free software. Um, an example of that from last year in the presentation was IceWeasel, uh, where the add-ons menu in the browser had a very prominent recommendation to install Evernote, which was a proprietary add-on and did not say that it was proprietary in that view inside IceWeasel. So there are cases of this where uh, the Debian packaging isn't recommending any non-free software, but immediately upon running the software and clicking on an option within the software, the user gets uh, shown non-free recommendations. So other distributions have been struggling with this problem as well, and uh, we're having to develop separate extension repositories in some cases for different programs in order to you know, extend that commitment to free software a little bit further. And I'll talk about uh, some of that toward the end, I hope. So. I think these issues are important to discuss within Debian, you know, regardless of what the FSF thinks. Uh, I think that you know, the social contract language that Debian remains 100% free and has no non-free requirements, has you know, tension with the idea that you want to support people who create or use non-free works in Debian, uh, that um, you'll support the use of non-free works and provide infrastructure for non-free packages. You know, those, there's a lot of play there that, that's tough to figure out. And I think for Debian itself, those are important topics to be discussing. I'm happy to see there's another presentation, at least one more, here that uh, plans on tackling those issues. 
So I know that some people see the FSF standards in these areas as uh, either a kind of censorship or as anti-user in some way by trying to kind of hide software from users or pretend like it doesn't exist. Um, but I think that Debian itself has many policies in place which are designed to steer users one way or another when it comes to the software that they use. You know, it seems to be a primary reason why the contrib section exists in the archive. Even if packages are free, if their only purpose is to point to non-free packages or install them, uh, they go in a separate place outside of main. Or, you know, there's limits on ways packages in main can refer to packages in, in non-free, especially when it comes to dependencies. And I know that since uh, the last DevConf, there was a technical committee decision that um, listing a non-free alternate dependency in a package in main is acceptable. And I was a little bit uncomfortable with that decision, but I also saw clearly that it is couched in terms of caution. You know, the actual presentation of the decision said that package maintainers should be very careful about using this because of the, uh, the way it can lead to use of non-free, and also that the main dependency is still a requirement. You can't have just a dependency on non-free. So I don't think, you know, even though the decision is not consistent with what the FSF is looking for in the distributions we endorse, I think it also didn't you know, change much about the things that we already have to talk about. I think that the act of making a distribution is by definition an act of steering users one way or another. Um, and that's why, in some senses, users choose a particular distribution, because they like the way that it uh, steers them and, and the kinds of software that it presents to them. So I don't think that Debian is actually uncomfortable with this idea. Um, I think it's a question of degree and, and of framing. And, and framing isn't just about semantics, it's about the questions that are posed and, and the way that they're answered. You know, are we talking about it in terms of censorship, or are we talking about it in terms of uh, supporting users who want to just one time choose all free software? and never be presented with a choice to install something non-free again. You know, so the framing of that question matters, and I think it's important that we talk about these things in specifics. You know, another example is security. Debian will remove packages that have security bugs that don't get fixed after a long time, uh, even though users may complain loudly about that because they want to continue using the software. So Debian makes a judgment about what kinds of software it wants its distribution to be associated with um, and then sets up you know, uh, practices and, and policies to facilitate that. So in the end, I don't think broad generalizations about steering, recommending, suggesting are really that helpful. It's a, a gray area. Um, it's not a bright line. And I think that we need to focus on the specifics of where we choose to draw that line. But the quickest way out of all this is to just make the vast majority of hardware or all hardware <laughs> if possible, uh, be supported by free software. And to have free applications, free versions of all applications that users might be said to require under the social contract. Right? If we have those things, then we don't have to worry about these questions. So uh, back in, at the end of July, the FSF uh, board had, our, uh, had its first ever strategic planning meeting. Um, and the most important five-year goals that were discussed at that meeting, I think are actually goals that are, uh, the vast majority of Debian developers probably also agree with. So I wanted to share some of those. So we want there to be readily available and contemporary hardware products that work with and contain all free software, in particular uh, laptops and tablets, um, but other devices as well. Uh, it's awesome that a LibreBoot X200 was, or was it given away this morning, or it's going to be given away? Did somebody in here win it? Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> um, I was really happy that we were able to certify that laptop under our Respects Your Freedom hardware program earlier this year. You know, we are, uh, despite no cooperation from manufacturers, uh, still catching up in terms of the uh, modernness of the laptops that we've been able to endorse. You know, I was actually using an X200 anyway at the time that the endorsement came out. So, you know, I know it's not as contemporary as a lot of people want, and that's why we still have this as a goal, but uh, I see us making some good progress there. And I'm, I'm really happy whoever donated that and, and made that a part of the conference this morning. Uh, we also want to end regulatory mandates for proprietary software. These exist in all kinds of places, you know, from the FCC to the IRS, you know, to uh, accessing government documents of various kinds. You know, all of these things create cultures around the world 
um, that are hostile to free software and therefore hostile to Debian. You know, you can't be an official Debian system user uh, and interact satisfactor satisfactorily with those systems. We want schools uh, adopting free software and compatible hardware for students. Uh, and I think initiatives to promote free software in those contexts also lead to great opportunities for Debian. You know, I assume that part of Debian's universal goal uh, is related to education and schools, and certainly any you know, long-term play at getting more people to use an operating system involves getting people using it at a younger age and getting comfortable with it. We want the general public to see free software as their issue. Uh, Debian also wants the general public to be Debian users, to be free software users. You know, I think many of us in the project don't like the reputation of Debian as an operating system that's specially suited for, uh, for sysadmins or servers. You know, we think that Debian is and can be a distribution that works for non-technical users as well. Um, and I think that getting the general public to understand that and give it a try is something, is a goal that we very much share. So obviously, you know, I said five-year goals. We're a little bit ambitious here. <laughs> Um, and these goals need to be, you know, fleshed out a lot. They need to be uh, quantified and made more specific. Um, but I wanted to present them, you know, they're only a few weeks old here, but I wanted to present them as a way to show that I think on uh, big picture issues, the FSF and Debian have a lot of agreement and that uh, professed disagreements have a lot more to do with things at the level of tactics and what's right in the current moment. Uh, but in the end, uh, we agree on things like this. So I think we should collaborate more on projects that get us closer to these things. Uh, last year, I presented this list. Um, and the first thing on the list was the free software directory. So the FSF has been building this directory of free software, uh, individual free software programs. Initially, it was supported by UNESCO. Um, and uh, for many years, it's been developed as a manually curated collection of free software that has no non-free dependencies and follows a basic level of good licensing practices. Does that sound like any other projects, maybe, that we're familiar with? <laughs> um, it's a lot like Debian. You know, the active packaging programs is a cura active curation. Uh, Debian packagers and developers become a little bit familiar with licensing. They have to be in order to make packages that get accepted. And of course, we all um, keep an eye out for things that don't follow good practices in those areas. So before, a few years ago, um, the directory was maintained by just a few people. We, we had a full-time staff position to do the majority of the work, along with a few great volunteers. Uh, but this approach never really scaled. So a few years ago, we decided to convert it to Semantic Media Wiki, um, enabling more people to add entries and, and keep those entries up to date. So truthfully, it still isn't fully Wikified. We're using the approved revs extension, which means that you have to be granted some extra access in order, to be able, in order for your changes to be immediately live. Otherwise, they have to be approved by somebody. Um, but we very readily give out editor access once a person's demonstrated that they understand the basics of the criteria for inclusion in the directory and that they understand the process. You know, a lot of that fault lies with us for not having better documentation, which we're working on. Uh, we have weekly IRC meetings every Friday in Pound FSF on Freenode, uh, where people have been getting together to add and update entries. Um, we no longer have the full-time staff position, so these meetings are run by Joshua Gay, who's the head of our uh, licensing and compliance lab, which turns out to be a very appropriate match because the hardest, the biggest challenge in deciding whether a program should be added to the directory or not is figuring out whether it's actually free software um, and whether it has any non-free dependencies. I think, as a lot of us know from Debian work, Upstream doesn't always make that very easy. So it's uh, an area that requires that kind of licensing expertise, which, by the way, is part of the point of the directory, because telling people to use free software when it is actually not that easy to figure out whether a given program that you find on the internet is free software is asking a lot of somebody. We want to make that easier. So this process, new process, has worked out very well, um, and we've seen a significant increase in participation. But at the same time, in parallel, we've been working on an automated uh, systems import all of Debian main into the directory. And this was something that we had in mind from the beginning of the decision to uh, convert it to Semantic Media Wiki. Um, and so from the beginning, we were looking at things like dev tags as the uh, guiding light for how our semantic property system should work. Um, we wanted to, first of all, we thought it was a good system. And second of all, we wanted to preserve, hopefully, um, forward compatibility for importing entries from Debian. 
So the idea here is to create entries in the directory for each appropriate package in main, uh, and then also to be able to automatically update those packages uh, with a system to reconcile those updates with any manual updates that have been made. And this whole process is made possible by the awesome system that Debian already has for structuring packaging information uh, and making that you know, predictable and regular within uh, packages. Um, one thing I have as a hope out of this project is that uh, we'll be able to help with some of the initiatives that seek to improve that system even further. Um, and that we'll be able to help, uh, and I think we already have a little bit, with helping to make sure um, that packages consistently apply those standards. You know, because we find, since we're doing this important and automated fashion, we find uh, hiccups and, and inconsistencies between packages. And I don't know if we've been uh, perfect about this, but we definitely have a goal to file you know, the appropriate bugs in those situations and, and patches to help fix it. So as part of an initial test since my talk last year, we've already imported about 1,500 packages um, to, as a test run, uh, which brings our total up to about 8,700 packages. And the next import, which, I, which may be happening as we speak right now, um, it was supposed to happen uh, this morning. So there may be entries being added from Debian main to the directory right now. Uh, this import will bring the total number up to 15,000. So it'll pull in another you know, 7,000 or so from Debian main. So I'm not the best person to talk about the technical details of this, like why aren't you know, the, all 43,000 packages already imported or what the challenges are. Uh, but if you want to drop by one of these IRC meetings or, or find me, I can connect you with the right people who can answer those questions. And of course, you can uh, read the source of the importer script, which is in that Git repository hosted at Savannah there. And I'm sure they will be happy to accept any uh, patches or uh, feedback from people who you know, the, the actual uh, script work was started by Daff, a Debian developer that, that a lot of you know, um, and has been continued by Ruben, who uh, was the founder and the developer of Triscoll, also very familiar with um, Debian and Ubuntu packaging. So uh, they have had some success, but they can always benefit from more eyes and advice from experienced folks. So why is this work important? You know, can't you just Google all the programs you need? You know, a lot of people have been kind of, uh, I've heard criticism of this project, along those lines before, but you know, actually increasingly, I have been feeling that the work of building this manually curated, cat curated catalog is incredibly important for uh, free software adoption. Uh, and in the long term, therefore, Debian adoption. So a big problem that we face uh, with convincing users to switch to GNU Linux is uh, to convince them to try a free application to begin with. They're not using GNU Linux, they're using Windows, or OS X. So it's asking a lot of somebody to say, yeah, just change your operating system. You know, trust me, everything you need is there. <laughs> right? It really can help to have individual programs that run on multiple platforms that people can acclimate to. Uh, and then after they're using a couple of those or a few of those, they may feel a lot more ready to spend the time to try out a distribution. Uh, and then they like what they see, we hope, and they uh, finish the process. But we face an obstacle with that, which is there's proprietary software companies out there uh, telling people not to download anything from the internet that doesn't come from one of their official locations. And frankly, uh, given the state of you know, computer security and malware, that's not terrible advice. So it's kind of hard to be the ones fighting for, no, <laughs> go ahead, install any program that offers itself uh, to you for free on the internet. That's not a good approach. Um, on top of that, you know, users are expecting uh, software to be presented in the form of you know, app stores and uh, curated locations now. Um, to the extent that we have those for free software in general, outside of distributions, um, they're mainly in directories that are curated for the purposes of advertising revenue and not really for the purpose of helping users. And then there's the fact that even for experienced users, it can be hard to figure out what the license of a program is like I mentioned. So we have a couple of goals here. One is that we want to use the directory as a canonical source of programs that are free, and then provide a mark that people upstream can display to show that they're included in the free software directory, and that can be uh, propagated as a sign of trust for an application. Not necessarily like that it's an awesome application or that it's perfectly secure, but at least that it is a free application, the source code is available, uh, follows some basic best practices. And then I also hope that it can turn into this sort of 
App Store free software marketplace for our users. And I think that uh, Debian <laughs> and other distributions have been were doing this App Store thing long before any of these came along and have been doing an awesome job at it. But that only kicks in once a user makes the leap to install it. So I, I think that it is in Debian's interests uh, to help with efforts to encourage users to make those first efforts at trying out applications that are also present in Debian on uh, the proprietary platforms that they're currently using. And I think that can be a way to get people uh, comfortable with the idea of uh, full GNU Linux distribution. Uh, people have talked about building other uh, App Store-like features onto the directory, things like reviews, user ratings, uh, demos, you know, ways to donate directly to projects. I think there's a lot of potential here with something like this. Um, and I look forward to seeing some of that materialize. I think in Debian, Debian terms, um, it can be a great source for you know, ITP and, and RFP bugs, looking for packages that are upstream free software programs that aren't yet packaged in Debian. Uh, I mean, that's the goal, and we're, we're going to be importing, hopefully, packages from other distributions as well. So it can be a place to look for seeing what other distributions have packaged that maybe um, hasn't made it into Debian yet. So getting involved in the project, uh, those are the basic ways. Um, if there's enough interest in the Debian community, you know, maybe this can become a, a joint project in some more official, uh, higher profile capacity. Uh, but you know, either way, uh, if individuals just want to help out, that's awesome. And uh, I want to definitely say thank you for doing the work to make this possible to begin with. Uh, this is you know, a free software directory that only lists 5,000 packages before we started this is not nearly as good as one that will um, build on the work that you all did and list 40,000 packages. So the next thing that I had talked about uh, last time was the situation with some upstream policy issues like Mozilla. This situation has become more complicated since last year. Uh, the Windows version of Firefox is now, is now calling out and installing a proprietary Adobe DRM module the first time Firefox is run. They're not yet doing this for the GNU Linux version, but it seems to be in the cards. Uh, and I already mentioned the issue with the proprietary add-ons. So uh, other programs do do this add-on approach better. You know, LibreOffice, for example, has a list of extensions. Its official list of extensions is all free software. So it's not as though this is some uh, pipe dream. The majority of Firefox extensions are free software. You know, it's just, I think, something that we share that we want to make sure users see those things clearly marked and that uh, Debian should be primarily leading users towards free software solutions for problems rather than the proprietary ones. So the main action that's happened on this over the last year was that as part of the free software directory, actually, if you look at the Ice, we sorry, Ice Cat page in the directory, um, but this applies for Ice Weasel as well, you'll see a list of extensions that have been uh, vetted and added. So there's a system within the directory to indicate that one program is, relate, is an extension for another program. And so we're using that to build a list of all of the free extensions. Um, I think this may become more urgent because of uh, Mozilla's decision to only allow signed extensions uh, in the official Mozilla repository. Um, signed extensions are great, um, but they're not allowing users to modify the keys in the browser, the accepted keys. So Firefox will only allow extensions that are signed by the official key. There's no interface for users to change. Well, there is an interface for users to change that. It's called rebuild the, pack, rebuild the software from source with the new keys in it. So I think there will be demands from other users to install signed extensions um, from people they trust, you know, so various developers that they're familiar with, uh, even though those extensions may not be signed by the official Mozilla key. Uh, the next thing that we had talked about was the uh, database of hardware that's compatible with all free, with, uh, free software. Um, this, I was happy, we actually put out an announcement shortly after DevConf last year together to say that we joined to help free software users find the hardware they need. So the FSF had been um, helping to build this database, different from other databases of compatible hardware. Normally, those are presented just as a question of does it work with the kernel Linux or not, um, regardless, of, well, regardless of whether it's uh, proprietary firmware or proprietary drivers required. So HNode um, takes a stricter approach and only lists hardware that works with a fully free system, like Debian main. So previously, we had said that users needed to be running, and this information all is user submitted. We'd previously said that 
uh, users needed to be running one of our endorsed distributions in order to contribute information, in order to avoid inaccuracies and slip-ups from people thinking that something was supported by a non-free driver, uh, or by a free driver, not realizing they had a non-free driver installed. Uh, but we, are, we made the change to add Debian main specifically to the front page of hno.org as also a valid and uh, recommended source of information for this. So I'd really love you know, to, to work more with um, Debian folks on this. There needs to be more information in the database. Uh, the site, the, the code that powers the site itself needs a lot of help. You know, design could be better. There are translations. There could be more. There's lots of opportunities to help out with different skill sets there. And I think that uh, I know there's been a lot of demand within the Debian community to um, how can we get the official distribution to work on more systems um, since we no longer have the proprietary firmware there? You know, how do we make it easier for users? So I think the first step is to make it easier for users to figure out what to buy in order to use Debian main. Um, and I think that's something in the Debian project we could do more on. And in the FSF, we're also going to be working hard at uh, doing more in that area. So if you'd uh, like to be employed working on any of these projects, <laughs> uh, we are actually hiring for a deputy director position <laughs> to work closely with me and the FSF staff and board on these issues, and uh, it does come with a star. Uh, if you are okay with living in Boston, um, which I'm told at least is the most European of American cities, uh, it's, uh, you know, our beer is not bad either. And short of that, uh, I will be here until Sunday, and would be happy to meet with people that are interested in, talk, in working on any of these projects that I mentioned, or talking about uh, other possibilities, other ideas. You know, I kind of lied about leaving a lot of time for questions, so please feel free to grab me and find me. Um, and there is still the FSF Collab Discuss. Oh, I don't have it on there. Uh, on Alioth, there is an FSF Collab Discuss mailing list. It's not been very active, but it is a great space in the past, but it's a great space that we can use now um, to continue conversations about this. And I'm subscribed, and, and we'll read anything that uh, people post there. So the bottom line for me for all this is that while the FSF is not promoting in the short term uh, Debian as a distribution, uh, we are working hard on projects that will help uh, the official Debian distribution flourish. And I think when you look at our utopian goals, um, they're very compatible, and I think that's a, a very good reason we should be finding more ways to work together to make those goals a reality. I think that if we do that, uh, we'll see the disagreements in perspective, um, and even probably see them uh, start to make way for more and more areas of agreement, because we really do have a lot of them. So, thank you. So if there are any questions, please line up to light left and right side. Hi, we heard a lot about what, uh, how Debian should change to be included in the FSF free software directory, or free software directory. What about the changes Debian would like to see in the GNU project or the FSF? Mm -hmm. Like the GFDL being considered non-free by Debian in some variants? Yeah, um, so first of all, I do think this is a, a dialogue that leads to changes on both sides. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't say that explicitly. In particular, I think that the, that if you look at the distributions that we've endorsed, they've been um, smaller projects, and the criteria sort of work differently when you're talking about smaller projects versus projects the size of Debian, uh, with the number of users that Debian has. So I see, I can see uh, our criteria and where we draw the line in that gray area being influenced uh, by the conversation with Debian as well. You know, if I had you know very specific changes that I thought had to be made, um, I would provide those, but I do think that it's actually a conversation that needs to happen. Uh, and with regards to GFDL, I think, you know, in my mind, that's an example of a disagreement that uh, will be, will not, in the end, be a blocker to uh, endorsement of uh, Debian by the FSF or 
um, vice versa. I think that uh, we understand each other's perspective on that, um, and it's not something that needs to be an obstacle to lots of other forms of uh, cooperation. You know, I think that we get on the same page about more things, and then we come back to that and see what we can agree on. Thank you. Other questions? Time to wake up. Um, well, this was not really related to Debian, so I was waiting to see if other people had more other questions. But um, regarding the like the director that you have for software for distributions, uh, the endorsement for distributions, do you have anything for services like that users even if they have a free system, but they agree in terms of services? in the cloud and yeah. so how how the users can be like can believe on fsf or any other um director or, or organization that will support us in making a decision yeah i think that's a very important issue and i had had it on the you know our, our approach primarily is to try to uh, encourage development of decentralized replacements, decentralized free software replacements for um, the services that people have been using. So I think that that's something that we can work together on also. You know, a big problem with why people don't already use the ones that are out there, like Media Goblin or GNU Social or Pump.io, um, is that they are not easy enough to set up. Um, and obviously as a distribution, you know, Debian has a big role to play and helping that, helping make that possible. So that's one answer is to, to try to uh, make the world better for users that don't want to use the centralized um, services. And then within the directory, we have uh, a way of creating different kinds of collections. So we can tie you know, those programs together as these are programs that are related to the problem of network services or uh, software as a service. Uh, and then we Soon we'll be publishing some recommendations and criteria for specifically hosting services, uh, what kinds of uh, criteria they should meet in order to be you know, used by GNU projects or recommended by GNU or the FSF. That's kind of one category of service that was really in the news after Gatorius went away and people were sort of like, well, you know, where do we go now um, if we don't want to go to a more centralized place like GitHub? So those are kind of currently what we have in mind. I definitely think there's a need for um, user, talking about user freedom outside of the programs which run on their individual computer and you know how they experience that on a network. Thank you. You um, previously talked a bit about um, hardware supporting uh, free software and free software supporting hardware. Uh, I just I wanted to know uh, what does the FSF thinks about uh, the participation of Steam in Debian and how um, even though Steam uses proprietary hard proprietary software, how can this help uh, bringing uh, free software to hardware? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we don't uh, like SteamOS as a distribution because it is, you know, does contain proprietary software. Um, it's possible that, you know, in the end, it may result in uh, games are a problem for free software users. Uh, you know, it's I can understand the perspective that it is an improvement over having a dual boot you know, Windows environment in order to play games. Uh, and I know that, uh, that Steam has been and Valve have been very cooperative, you know, technically speaking, with the Debian community. Uh, I think that we should continue to you know, uh, ask them to release the Steam code itself as free software. Um, and also to make sure there's room within any you know, marketplace of software that people are using for free applications, which I'm not sure that that's possible in Steam right now. So, you know, I think uh, we definitely need more initiatives around free games. You know, we do some small things at the FSF. We run a Libra Planet gaming server uh, that you can get involved in administering or playing games on, and it has, you know, mostly some of the classic multiplayer free software games. But uh, it's a, you know, a topic we're interested in. It's just, um, you know, we need to, to find ways to compete with a lot of social aspects, like the fact that 
video game companies get subsidies to make proprietary software, uh, and the industry is extremely competitive that way. So there's a lot of problems to tackle there. Um, Steam may end up, in the end, being helpful, but I think you know in the short term it's not something we can recommend users to install. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of expand a bit on what was said a moment ago about, well, essentially uh, cloudy stuff, software as a service, things like that. Um, this is something that Debian is coming to recognize, I think, as one of the biggest threats to user freedom in general. Most of the people here in the room will probably have a non-free phone uh, running all sorts of interesting applications. Um, and it's quite difficult at the moment to do better with that. I know the FSF are slightly, you know, going in that direction. There's, there's some projects within the FSF, but I think I'm slightly concerned at your list of strategic goals mm -hmm. doesn't seem to have that as, you know, a, a, a thing that really needs to be addressed. And you want to be looking at that uh, yeah. much more closely. Yeah, I think that it's. Uh, I think that in the discussion, it, it is implied by a couple of the goals. Um, one of which, like you said, that there's a very tight connection between the mobile environment and the service environment. You know, it's uh, these services have, are getting a lot of traction because on smaller devices, uh, you want to be able. To, well, you have multiple devices, so you want to be able to access your files from multiple different places. Um, you want to be able to participate in services like you know Uber, airline applications. You know all these things that. Uh, are geared toward life well, you know, in a mobile sense. So I think addressing the mobile side of things, having all of those applications be free software is a precondition to uh, effectively addressing the service question. Um, and then I think that the issue of having the, the general public see free software as their issue um, should probably, I should have actually written that as the general public to see user freedom as their issue. And I think that that is getting people to care about what happens with their, uh, when they give up control over the software that they would in the past have run on their system to a remote server that whether that software on the server is free or not doesn't matter because the user using it doesn't have access to the code or to modify the code or do anything with it. So I feel like um, the goal of getting people to see their freedom as an issue uh, strongly implies figuring out how to replace that you know, remote service model but uh, probably should be said explicitly there, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I recall from earlier bits from the DPL mm, letters that there was some ongoing discussion between you and the, the DPL about uh, solving the this um, endorsement problem. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give a status of, or maybe can you give your view of the effectiveness of these discussions and whether they are stored or they are still ongoing? Uh, so yes, so that started um, when Zach was DPL um, and has continued uh, since then. And I think that they have been I mean, that, they're why I'm here talking about this. You know, I, I think that those conversations made me feel very welcome uh, to come and have a conversation and, and to talk with people, you know, in addition to the DPL and the Debian community um, about these things. So I think they've been very, you know, from my side, they've been very effective uh, at getting things started back up again. Um, they have been slow, but I will accept, you know, basically all of the blame for that. Uh, I have not in any case been waiting for a reply from the Debian side. Uh, so they have been slow, but that's my fault. Um, and anybody who's been on that mailing list for uh, quite a while knows that there was kind of a burst of activity at the beginning, and then um, I didn't follow up on what I was supposed to do, and it uh, kind of trailed off. So what I've been trying to do by coming uh, last year and this year is to commit myself again to helping those conversations move forward. Uh, but I really appreciate the support that I've gotten from the Debian side and all the DPLs. Thank you. So thank you very much, John. Thank you.